would you break, lower that blind there? All right, right in. <laughs> Praise the Lord for the sunshine. Thank you, Nathan, so much. That's one of my favorite songs. Abide with me. What a precious truth. Turn to the book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 30. The book of 2 Chronicles, chapter 30. Have you ever been laughed at or made fun of? I have. When I was in high school, the kids made fun of me for carrying my Bible to school. They called me Holy Joe. When I worked at a particular company a number of years ago and I would witness and talk to people, they too would make fun of me for my testimony. Even through the years, I've had family members as I have witnessed to them and stood for truth and right. And they would make fun of our standards and our holy living and our separation and, and laugh at us and, and scorn from time to time. In 2 Chronicles chapter 30, we have what I call a message entitled, Who's Laughing Now? Who's Laughing Now? In 2 Chronicles chapter 30, King Hezekiah sends out a letter to all of Israel and Judah. And as he sends out this letter, I call it, maybe we could entitle this sermon, I usually like a couple of titles, The Laughing Letter. Because when people get this letter in the mail, not everybody, but there's a number of people, they read this letter and they burst out laughing. They, they burst out mocking and making fun of. Look at uh, chapter 30, verse 10. It says, So the post passed from city to city through the country of Ephraim and Manasseh, even unto Zebulun. They laughed him to scorn and mocked him. So what did this letter say? Well, in short, this letter said, we're going to turn to the Lord God Jehovah and we're going to have a Passover and we're going to seek the Lord. So when people got this letter, they just started laughing. Who does he think he is? Who does he think we've been worshiping? You remember they had set up the uh, brazen serpent that uh, the Israelites, you remember, that God told them under Moses, to look at the brazen serpent and they would live. Well, Israel had set that serpent up on the, in, in uh, the land and it had become an idol. It was called Nehushta. They had heathen gods, idolatry, immorality. In fact, his father had, had uh, worshipped uh, idols and set even his children as human sacrifices to these heathen gods. And we'll look at that in just a moment. So you can imagine the mocking, the laughter, and making fun of King Hezekiah when he sends out this letter. We're going to do what? We're going to worship who? We got our gods. We got our practices. We got our lifestyle. We don't want to change. So they're mocking him and making fun of him. King Hezekiah. But tonight in the moments that we have, I'm going to try to be quick. Famous last words. <laughs> I want to look at his parents. I want to look at his Passover. And I want to look at his praise. This man, Hezekiah. As we look at these three truths about this man who sent out this laughing letter, I want to look at his parents had a great impact on his life. His parents had a great impact upon his life. Who was King Hezekiah's father? Well, if we look back in your Bible, a couple of chapters, we find in chapter 28 of 2 Chronicles that his father was named Ahab. He was 20 when he came to power. In 2 Chronicles 28, he was 20 years old when he began to reign. 
And he reigned 16 years in Jerusalem. And he did not that which was right in the sight of the Lord like David his father. Of course, the Hebrew father there means grandfather or father. So here he was, 20 years old. Maybe we would call him a millennial. I don't know if he fits into that age group somewhere around in there. But the Bible, of course, tells us he was wicked and ungodly. In fact, if you'll keep reading, uh, look what it says in verse 2. He walked in the ways of the kings of Israel and made also molten images for Baal. Now, of course, the kings of Israel, there no more good kings in Israel. They were all wicked and ungodly. So look at verse 3. Moreover, he burned incense in the valley of the son of Hinnom and burnt his children in the fire. Now, of course, thank God it wasn't Hezekiah. Some may believe it was maybe by another wife he had some children or maybe it was one of Hezekiah's uh, brothers or sisters. We don't know. After the abomination of the heathen, whom the Lord had cast out before the children of Israel. Can you imagine that? Now here his father is offering his children as human sacrifices to these heathen gods. And, and the Bible tells us that he was doing like the Canaanites were doing. That's what the Canaanites were doing when the Israelites came into the promised land as they worshiped these heathen gods. And now... Hezekiah's father, can you imagine that, is offering his children up as human sacrifices to the gods, these wicked and ungodly gods of, of Judah. In fact, we know during the time of Isaiah that Isaiah stood before Ahaz, you remember in the book of Isaiah chapter 7, and he pleaded with Ahaz to seek the Lord. You remember it's in Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. In fact, he told uh, Ahaz to seek a sign from the Lord that God would deliver him. Now remember that Ahaz is of the messianic line of David. So we find in chapter 7, you remember the background of that story, that the Syrians and Israel had shown up at his door and they said, we're going to kill you. We're going to wipe out you and all your children. And they did take a number of the people of Judah captive, uh, as the Bible tells us. And we won't get into all of that. But again, Isaiah said, ask the Lord a son. And a famous verse, Isaiah chapter 7 and verse 14. Behold, therefore the Lord himself shall give you a sign. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and shall call his name Emmanuel. Very famous scripture, prophecy. That was under King Ahaz. Well, he didn't. In fact, he turned to Assyria for help. And again, a little background of that, you must go to 2 Kings chapter 16. And what did he do? To, uh, you can read some of the account of what Ahaz did. But to sum it up somewhat, here's what he did. He went up to Assyria. He took some of the things of, uh, listen, listen to what he did. He took some of the golden, the silver, and the gold, 2 Kings 16 and verse 8. He took the silver and the gold that was found in the house of the Lord in the treasures of the king's house and sent them for a present to the king of Assyria. Now can you imagine that? Remember the brazen labor used. You remember the golden uh, things of the temple. He took a bunch of all that and sent it to Assyria as a bride to say, hey, protect me from Syria and from Israel. Well, he did. The king of Assyria did. But he also, Ahaz, went up there, visited him, and saw one of, one of his heathen gods came back to Jerusalem and made a God like the king of Assyria had and made Israel worship that. What I'm telling you is, this is Hezekiah's father. You think, you can't get much more wicked, ungodly, than that. 
And these are just a, a number of the things that uh, we're sharing with you, what the scripture tells us emphatically that Ahaz was like. And this was the father that Hezekiah had growing up. But as we see in chapter 30, and also is recorded in Kings, and Hezekiah comes to rule at the age of 25, I mean he steps on the scene and brings a revival and a Passover and the, the Feast of Unleavened Bread to the nation of Judah. I mean, uh, it was, there, there's never been one like it up till then. Look with me, and, and we're jumping ahead, but I want you to see. I mean, as Hezekiah came, he sent out this letter, and he said, we're going to worship God. In fact, he tore down the Hishta, and he, uh, I mean, purged the land of sin. We're going to get into that. And then notice in verse 26 of chapter 30, just kind of letting you know in, in brief what kind of man Hezekiah was. So there was great joy in Jerusalem for since the time of Solomon, the son of David, king of Israel, there was not the light in Jerusalem. Then the priest of the Levites arose and blessed the people, and their voice was heard, and their prayer came up to his holy dwelling, even unto heaven. You say, what in the world happened? Here Hezekiah, the moment he hits the throne, he purges the land, brings the Passover, serves the, serves the Lord Jehovah God, and becomes one of the greatest godly kings of Judah. But his dad? So we asked ourselves, where did he get his spiritual heritage and influence from? Where, where did it come from? Of course, we know it was in spite of his dad. And we believe that maybe he saw the wickedness and ungodliness that took place. And he made a choice. And he said, that's not for me. And praise God that that may happen in our lives. As we see our parents and the foolish and ungodly and bad decisions that they made, and Hezekiah said, you know what? Uh, I saw my brother, maybe it was half brother, full brother, be offered as a sacrifice to the gods of the heathen. And he said, that's not for me. And praise God for that. But I believe there's a little bit of inkling in the scripture of where he got his godly heritage from. And I believe it was from his mother. His mother. His mother's only mentioned twice in the scripture, and in that very briefly at all. So who was his mother? Look back, chapter 29. 2 Chronicles chapter 29 and verse 1. And Hezekiah began to reign when he was five and twenty years old. And he reigned nine and twenty years in Jerusalem. And his mother's name was Abijah, the daughter of Zechariah. Now she's also mentioned in 2 Kings chapter 18, in verse 1 and 2, and it's a, a short abbreviation of her name. His mother's name was also Abijah. Now, Abijah simply means Jehovah is a father. <coughs> or God is a father. That, that was his, his mother's name. Now here's the question. Who was she? The Bible tells us in this particular verse, she was the daughter of Zechariah. Now, the big question is, who was he? Now again, it's difficult oftentimes in your Bible to find out who people were, almost like a family tree. Uh, I found that out in my own family tree that you had different relatives named the same. And when you do that in your Bible, you go to Bible uh, Concordance or Dictionary and look up Zechariah, you'll have 11 or different 12 Zacharias 
You say, well, which one was it? So again, there's speculation that this Zechariah was one of the kings of Israel as he is mentioned in the scripture. And let me just give you a quick summation of who he may have been. You remember the kingdom split after Solomon's death. Rehoboam went to the south and Jeroboam was to the north. There were no godly kings, you remember, in the northern kingdom. Jeroboam built a temple in Samaria, the capital of Israel. And there, as he set up heathen sacrifices to the gods there in the northern kingdom. Here enters Zechariah, possibly Abijah's father, who succeeds Jeroboam as king of the northern tribe of Israel in 753 B.C. He only rules for six months. Now this is a commentator says about who Zechariah possibly was. He does evil in the eyes of the Lord as his father did. He did not turn away from the sins of Jeroboam. He caused Israel to commit sin. In fact, Zechariah was an evil ruler and decried the law of Moses. As a ruler who was immersed and in propagated the pagan traditions, he was nonetheless quite aware of the Jewish law. His daughter Abijah would have been raised under some guise of Jewish tradition as well, as their culture and household would have been a mixture of both lifestyles. She would have seen the purity and the blessings and spiritual godliness of the Jews in Judah against the backdrop of the pagan idol worship being celebrated by her family in Israel. Abijah would have discerned how the further away the people and her father the king went from God's law, the further the people of Israel slid into a life of depravity and evil. After six months, Zechariah was assassinated. It is completely plausible, one commentator said, that this assassination of her father took place in front of Abijah. Having witnessed her father's gruesome murder would not have only left her in a total state of shock and fear, but also caused her stock in her current situation. Somehow she was wed to the southern king Ahaz. And that was not uncommon in those days as kings would often marry their daughters for alliances and so forth. Seeing again how defiant of God's law leads only to death, Abijah would have quite literally run into the arms of God and her faith, trust, and love and hope back into the God of Abraham. She vows to serve him, not outwardly as fear that her husband would put her to death, but through her son Hezekiah, teaching him the ways of the ancients, instructing him on the laws of Moses and David, she knows that adherence to the law and worshiping the God of Abraham would be the key to saving the nation of Judah. So privately, she taught her son Hezekiah the ways and the things of the Lord, maybe behind the scenes. According to Josephus, Elijah became a citizen of Jerusalem through her marriage to King Ahaz, and thus enjoyed the many rights of this afforded her. She quite possibly had access to many tutors and the finest education for her son. And that possibly could have happened. We don't know. We don't know. But I believe there was a decision in Abijah's life to say, I've seen my husband, I've seen my family, I've seen one child offered to the heathen God. He's not going to get all of them. But may I submit to you a second theory of who Zechariah was. And again, both are, are plausible. Again, John Butler in his commentary on this verse gives this suggestion. Again, as we look into the scripture, look at 2 Chronicles chapter 26. 
Second Chronicles chapter 26 and verse 5. Now this is under Uzziah, the king of Judah. Now he reigned, as we know, for many years, from 783 to 742. Uzziah was a godly king of Judah. And underneath his reign, Notice there's a man, a counselor, a priest, and he sought God in the days of Zechariah, who had understanding in the visions of God, and as long as he sought the Lord, God made him to prosper. And also, there's Zechariah mentioned, Butler says, in Isaiah chapter 8, in verse 2, as being a priest of the Lord. So again, the implication is this is the Zechariah that is the father of Abijah, not the one who was king of Israel. Now, I did a little figuring in my office, and I'm not going to take time to figure in front of you, but I kind of did a little bit of math, a little bit of math, a little bit of figuring, and according to the timeline, it seems like to me that John Butler is right. Because when you do a little bit of figuring of the kings of Israel and the kings of Judah, and realize that it probably fits a little bit better that Ahaz, being a king of Judah, would have married uh, a woman from Judah rather than Israel and there is a probability that it was Zechariah and that Abijah had a godly heritage how did she get mixed up with a wicked man like Ahaz again the scripture doesn't tell us was it a forced marriage was it something that she had gotten away from God and then when she saw all the evil around her she decided you know what one son's been sacrificed to the gods of the heathen. He's not getting another one. We don't really know. But I have a tendency to believe that Elijah's father, Zechariah, had an impact in her family upon her. And when she saw all this evil around her, one commentator said that it didn't escape the notice that King Hezekiah's mother, Abijah, was mentioned. The scripture tells us that Abijah was the daughter of Zechariah, who was the spiritual counselor to another Judah's fairly decent kings, King Uzziah. I just have to believe that Abijah played a significant role in keeping this young Hezekiah away from the evil influences of Ahaz and brought him up to fear the Lord. We don't really know. But I believe in some form or fashion there was an influence of Hezekiah's mother as she possibly influenced Hezekiah to the Lord. He made a definite stand when he came to the throne against his father, against the evil and the wicked and ungodliness of his father's side and said, I'm going to go the way of my mother and what she had taught me to honor and worship God. We have decisions to make, each and every one of us. His Passover had a great effect upon the nation of Jesus. Second Chronicles chapter 30. But as you think about the Passover, there's another feast day that you must keep in mind, you remember. It's the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Look in Second Chronicles 30 and verse 13. And there assembled at Jerusalem much people to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread in the second month, a very great congregation. And they arose and took away the altars that were in Jerusalem. And all the altars were incense. And they took away and cast them into the brook 
of Kidron. Remember Kidron was the valley of Hinnom. It was almost like the ash heap, the dump of Jerusalem. You remember that's where the, the probably the bodies of the two thieves were cast outside of Jerusalem that were crucified with the Lord. And they said there was a continual smoke that went up from the valley of Hinnom. And that's exactly uh, what he did is the beast of unleavened bread. What do you do before the Passover? You go and get rid of all the leaven in the home. And that's what Hezekiah did. Let's get rid of all the wickedness and idols and heathen worship. Get this out of here. And 2 Kings 18 and verse 4 says, And he removed the high places and break the images and cut down the groves and break in pieces the brazen serpent that Moses had made. For in, on those days the children of Israel burned incense into it. And he called it Nehishtan. And somebody said, hey, your daddy worship that God. I don't care. We're not going to do it anymore. Let's get rid of it. I'm taking a different path. And he did. What a Passover. Because he chose to worship the Lord. It says that the king in verse 2 had taken counsel and his princes and all the congregation in Jerusalem to keep the Passover in the second month. Oh, and they could not keep it at that time because the priest had not sanctified themselves sufficiently, neither had the people gathered themselves together unto Jerusalem. What did they have to do? They said, we need to deal with sin. Verse 19, that prepared his heart to seek God, the Lord God of his fathers, though he be not cleansed according to the purification of the sanctuary. Isn't that true in our lives as well? That we're going to want fellowship with God. We want communion with him. We must deal with sin. The Bible says in 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Remember what James said, from hence come wars and fightings among you. Come they not hence, even of your lusts that war in your members. Ye you lust and have not, ye kill and desire to have, and cannot obtain, ye fight and war and have not, because ye ask not. He said, ye adulterers and adulteresses, know ye not that the friendship of the world is an enmity with God? Whosoever therefore shall be a friend of the world is an enmity. What did he say back in chapter 1 and verse 21? Wherefore, lay apart all filthiness and superfluity of naughtiness and receive with meekness the engrafted word which is able to save your soul. What does a Christian have to do? We want fellowship with God? You can't hold hands with the world and hold hands with God. Judah's been trying to do that. And many Christians try to do it today. But you can't do it. Notice the praise in Judah was so great. Oh, after they got rid of these idols and got rid of the heathen worship and got rid of the human sacrifice to the heathen gods and said, we're going to worship Jehovah God. And as they had a Passover, I mean, God blessed. And listen, uh, the Bible says there was great joy in Jerusalem. The joy when you deal with sin. Make things right with God. For since the time of Solomon, the son of David, the king of Israel, there was not the like in Jerusalem. Now, again, you can do the math. Uh, Solomon reigned about 970. And this is around, as a guy came to power in about 715. So that's a pretty long time. What a revival. What a stirring. What a movie. What joy. He said, we had not had a revival like this since Solomon's days and David's days. Oh, oh, what a great time. Oh, listen, when you and I deal with sin in our lives, we can, David said, restore to me the joy of thy salvation. When he confessed his sin to the Lord, he realized he had lost it. He wanted that joy. I like what Paul said to the church of Philippi. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Let your moderation be known unto all men. The Lord is at hand. Oh, what a man. Hezekiah. His daddy sure didn't encourage him.
something to live for God? What influence his mother had, we do not know. Maybe she might have been wicked too, we don't know. But Hezekiah decided in his life, you know what, I'm going to make a stand. And he made it strong. And he brought a Passover to Jerusalem. They talked, it had been like this in years. There was great joy and rejoicing in Jerusalem. And Hezekiah is mentioned in the Bible as one of the godliest kings you remember of Judah. In spite of his father. The praise. God oftentimes helps us see a bad example that we might set a good example. Would you bow with me in prayer? The laughing letter, you could call this sermon. But I could say, who's laughing now? Who's laughing now? The people are rejoicing. The streets are full of laughter and joy. And there's been uh, cleansing and purging. There's been a Passover like you've never seen in several hundred years. Oh, how God is blessed. Who's laughing now? You know, as you make a decision to serve God, you see those who don't, you can say, you know, they chose a bad and ungodly path, and I look at my godly heritage, heritage and maybe you can look at yours and say, praise God, I'm glad I'm on the right path. Lord, help us in these days in which we live. Choose to serve the Lord like Hezekiah. He made a definite stand. And that stand went against his heritage. And we're glad he did. Help us in Jesus' name. Amen.